simply the title of my message is why. Why do things happen to all of us? Have you ever had a time in your life where you question, why is this happening? Why, is, why am I facing this sickness? Why is this disease um, hindering me? Why did I lose my job? Why am I struggling financially? You know, why do good things or why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Also, why do good things happen to bad people? <laughs> That's even more frustrating sometimes, right? You're like, here I am following God over here, and this person is living like the devil, and he's being blessed, right? That's <laughs> frustrating to see sometimes. So we're going to go through and talk about today, how do we navigate times and seasons and events in our lives where we're struggling to understand why they're happening? I'm going to go through four questions that we can ask ourselves to help us understand and comprehend that question, why? So the first of all, jumping off, number one, did, the number one question to ask yourself if you're going through something that you don't understand why is, did I sow to this? Many of the situations that we face in our own lives are our own doing. We can't blame God. We can't blame the devil even. There are, are, we're reaping what we've sown. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul says this, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God, you will always harvest what you plant. Always harvest what you plant. Did you lose your job? Well, what kind of employee were you? Were you showing up for work on time? Were you staying off your cell phone and actually working? Were you, you know, being a good employee? Were you um, working hard? Are you having a health crisis? Well, what have you been sowing into your body? Right? Sometimes we are just reaping what we've sown. Are you in constant fear all the time? Well, what are you bringing into your life? What are you allowing to cross through to your mind? Are you watching scary movies all the time and wonder why you're scared at night and can't sleep? Are you uh, listening to um, people that are around you? Sometimes, you know, people around you will bring fears into your life. I have uh, some family members that every time I go and speak to them. The only thing they want to talk about is how everybody's sick in the family. Anybody have somebody like that? The first thing they talk about all the time is, well, so-and-so's not doing well, and our family is always um, um, going through this, and it runs through the family, and by the time you um, leave, you're <laughs> kind of getting scared. Like, wow, everybody's sick. Are you facing financial difficulties? Well, what have you sown into your finances? Are you um, giving? Are you... Um, um, you know, handling your finances wisely, sowing and reaping. You will always sow what you reap. There was a truck driver that late one evening, he comes and pulls into a late night truck stop and, you know, it's open. He goes in and orders some food and the waitress comes and brings him his food and these three rough looking bikers pull up and they come in and these are, you know, like the, the real rough bikers, you know, like the Hell's Angels type and they pull in, and one of them comes up and grabs the guy's burgers. The other, their burger, the other guy comes up and grabs a handful of fries, and then the other one comes up and takes his coffee. And they start, you know, eating in his food. The guy doesn't handle it maybe how you expect. He's probably scared out of his mind, for one. But he picks his check up and goes and just lays the money on the register and walks out. And the waitress comes up and puts the money in the register, rings him up, and watches the guy drive off in his truck walks back to the three bikers, and the bikers say, he's not much of a man, is he? She's like, I don't know about that, but he sure isn't much of a truck driver because he ran over three bikes on his way out the drive. <laughs> you always sow what you reap. Or, yeah, reap what you sow. Luke 6.38 says it like this, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Like I said, many times God gets the blame for situations that we put ourselves in. And many times, we, you know, it's easy to blame the devil too, isn't it? Like, man, the devil keeps on attacking me. Well, many times the devil gets blamed for stuff that we're doing to ourselves. So what do you do if, if you're saying, well, that's me. I've been sowing all kinds of terrible things into my life, and now I'm scared, kind of scared that I'm going to reap them all. Well, here's the good thing is that we have um, forgiveness through Jesus Christ. He can make all things new. 
we can, first of all, if you just repent. What does repent mean? It means to turn around, to change your direction, to change your focus. The first thing you need to do if you're sowing into something that you know is going to harm you is to stop doing it. You know what they say is um, the first thing to do when you're digging yourself a hole is to stop digging, right? <laughs> Sometimes we just need to stop digging. Stop sowing these things into our lives. Repent. Turn around. Change your mind about that. God will help you. That's a good thing is we can always ask for help from the Father. He gives us grace, which is his ability, that we can um, turn our lives around and change. Rely on his ability. Quit trying to do it in your own strength. God will give you the grace to do it, and then he'll restore. He can make all things new. He can turn this thing around, and, and uh, you can pray for crop failure, right? Say, I don't want to reap all these things I'm sowing, God. I pray that these things will not, I will not reap the things that I've sown in my life. God will restore. He's a restoring God. He's a good, a good father. He's a good daddy. He'll restore your life. So number one question to ask yourself is, did I sow to what is happening in my life? Number two, did God do this to me? That's the big question, right? Is what's happening in my life, is this an act of God in my life? Is he doing these things to me? You know, in the Old Testament, God can kind of seem like an angry, horrible person, right? If you read the Old Testament, you'll see times where God tells um, his people to go into a city and kill everybody. Women, children, everybody, just wipe them out. And you're thinking, wow, God, why did you do that? Is God a murderer or is he a loving father? Which one? Is he a schizophrenic God? Is he one, a murderer sometimes, but he's a loving father at other times? Who here has seen the movie Old Yeller? It's, it's a classic. It's a good one. An old Disney movie from the 60s. But if you love animals... I don't know, it might be a little sketchy, but <laughs> well, what happens is this uh, stray dog wanders up on this farm, and um, the oldest boy takes a liking to him. His name's Travis. He loves this dog. He, um, the dog becomes part of the family, and one day some wolves, some stray wolves come and attack the family, and this dog is brave and comes up uh, yellow. It's a yellow dog, so they call him Old Yeller, and comes and protects the family. Well, what happens is the wolf had rabies and the dog, Old Yeller, got rabies. So they locked him up in a cage and just slowly deteriorates and becomes more and more just erratic and angry. One day the little boy comes up and the little boy doesn't understand these things, the little brother, and he wants to let him out. And the dog is just foaming at the mouth and attacks and um, if it wasn't for the mother coming and shutting the door, then the boy would have been attacked. So the mother goes in and gets the gun, shotgun out, hands it to Travis, and it's with tears in his eyes. He has to shoot the dog that he loved, old yeller. But he did it out of love. He didn't do it because he hated the dog. He did it because this dog had a disease that was, would have spread to everybody, the entire family, if it wasn't put down. You know, there was a disease that started with Adam of sin. This disease was spreading throughout the entire earth. If it wasn't stopped, none of us would be here today. We would have destroyed the entire human race before Jesus could have come into the earth to set us free from that disease, from sin. So what seemed like an angry God pouring his wrath out on people was an act of love towards us. He wanted us to be able to experience forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That's why the Old Testament sometimes, it seemed like, you know, God was an angry God. Isaiah 54, 7 says this. So this is speaking of the time after Jesus would come into the earth. For a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with great compassion, I will take you back. In a burst of anger, I turned my face for a little while. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Just as I swore in the time of Noah that I would never again let a flood cover the earth, so now I swear I will never be angry and punish you. For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. 
my covenant of blessing will never be broken. Say that, never. Never be broken, says the Lord who has mercy on you. We have a better covenant now than they did in the Old Testament. All the wrath God had towards sin was taken at the cross by Jesus. He will never punish you out of anger again. I like what James 1.17 says, <clears throat> excuse me, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Say this with me. Say, if it's not good, it's not God. God's not the one making people sick today. He's not the one taking your finances from you. He's not the one uh, punishing you. So if God's not the one doing this, then who is? Number three, who, who's doing this? Why are these things happening if it's not God? Well, let me tell you this, is we have an enemy. We have an enemy that wants to do nothing, but what uh, John 10.10 10 says is that he wants to steal, to kill, and destroy. Those are the things that the enemy wants to do, and then he wants to blame God for it and say it's God's fault. He's the one doing this, but it's the enemy that comes to steal to kill, and to destroy. How many of you know who Ted Turner is? He's a uh, media mogul that, he was a founder of CNN and TBS and multi-billionaire. I think uh, his, his net worth is $2.2 billion. He's a rich man. And he's also um, known for being an atheist, very anti-Christian. And in fact, and he made a speech in 1990 to the American Humanist Association and he had a tirade against Christianity, and he said, Christianity is a religion for losers. People did an interview with, uh, with him after that. I think it was in Ethics magazine. And he says this. He says, I lost my religious belief when my sister got lupus. He said, candidly, she was 12, and she died at 17. I was 15 when she got it. She was ill. It ruined her mind. She became insane. She used to go around the apartment and run into the padded walls and say, God, I'm in so much pain. Please let me die. Turner spoke matter-of-factly about the toll her illness and his unanswered prayers took on his life. How could God let my sister suffer so much? She never did anything wrong. Turner says she was 12 years old. He said in another article that he prayed an hour a day, every day for her when she was sick, and she still died. Those kind of unanswered questions, if you don't get a grasp on it, will ruin your faith. Those kind of unanswered questions can cause people to turn against God. You know, we, we can be so quick to judge people and their beliefs, and, and you know, if somebody doesn't believe in God, but we don't know what they've been through. Maybe nobody ever took the time to explain to him that it wasn't God that did this to you. So all these questions of why. Why does God let these things happen then? Why do these bad things happen? If it's not God, then who is it? Well, the enemy wants to convince us that God is doing these things. He wants to bring confusion into our lives about these things. Adam is actually the cause of it all. <laughs> we can blame Adam. He's the one that gave, see, God had created this perfect world. He put Adam and Eve in this garden and said, you are going to live forever in this place. I'm going to give you the tree of life that you can freely eat of. But he also put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in there. I don't know why, but my kind of theory is that, well, you know, God didn't want robots that had to serve him. He wanted people that he could be a loving father to and that enjoyed serving him. That's just my theory. It's, don't take that as gospel. But Adam gave up dominion by eating of the apple or whatever fruit, whatever you want to call it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin and death. Those two things entered into the world. Jesus came and forgave us our sins, took away all sickness and disease, but uh, this side of heaven, we still, our bodies still aren't redeemed yet. Every one of us are going to die in this earthly human body. 
We're going to face things in this earthly human body. I believe God wants us to live healthy lives, completely free of sickness and disease. Why it doesn't happen, I can't tell you. There's things that I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven. Why? <laughs> that might be one of them. Why, do people, why are certain children born with birth defects? You know, why? Am I the only one that answers these questions or asks these questions? I'm a curious guy, I guess. I want to know why things happen. You ever um, have a, you know, two-year-old that is always constantly asking why? Very curious. They want to know, you know, why is the sky blue? So, you know, in their comprehension, you can't go through all the scientific reasons that the sky is blue. You can't, you know, uh, go through research papers of smart people that have determined why things happen. You just say what? You say, just because. It is. Sometimes we have to be okay with not understanding all the reasons why, because we probably wouldn't be able to comprehend some things anyway. God's so much bigger and so, so his knowledge is so much more infinite than ours. Sometimes we just, in our human understanding, can't reason why things happen. But we know that God is a good God. He's good. That's the one thing we have to understand and, and we have to go through our lives thinking that when we come up with times and, and seasons where we don't know why, here's the question you got to ask yourself. Do I trust him? Am I going to trust him even in times where I don't know why, even when things happen that I can't understand? And last of all, how am I going to react to it? See, this is the important thing. How are you going to react when things happen where you don't understand? In Acts 16, the Apostle Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia that was pleading to him, come to Macedonia to help us. So Paul and Silas boarded a boat and headed for Macedonia. On the way, they stopped in a town called Philippi. And on the Sabbath, they went and started talking to some women about Jesus. And they believed, these women believed and were baptized. Then a demon possessed woman started to follow them and mock them. So they cast the demon out. See, these are all good things, right? I mean, they're just following the leading of the Holy Spirit. They go to this city. They, went, they preach the gospel to them. These women get saved. Then a demon-possessed woman who was just tortured by her demon comes behind them, and they cast the demon out. You'd think they'd be celebrated, right? These men are doing great things. But see, the slave owners of that woman, that was their meal ticket. They, um, she had that spirit of divination, so um, she was like a psychic, and people would pay her to, um, you know, give them readings. So these people weren't very happy when the demon was cast out. They wanted that demon inside of her. So they dragged Paul and Silas to the city officials. And here's what happened in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 22. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Wow. That's, almost what, what, that's what you get for following the leading of the Holy Spirit, right? They were beaten. They were thrown into prison. They were put in the inner dungeon, which was not a good place, and they were put in stocks. I would have been kind of frustrated, right? Be honest with you. I would have said, God, why are you doing this to me? I'm just following your lead. And this is what happens to me? See, it's times in our lives where we are doing the right thing. It seems like we're, you know, going where we're supposed to be going, and these things happen to us that are the hardest to understand. They're the hardest to reason why they're happening. But see, we have a choice of how we're going to react to it. Are we going to react well? Are we going to do the right thing? no matter what our circumstances are at the time? Or are we going to blame God and throw a pity party for ourselves and, uh, you know, just get angry and bitter? Here's what Paul and Silas did. Verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. 
What a way to react to this. They started to pray and to sing to God. Man, I wish I had that uh, faith that I could do that every, every time I face something I don't understand. Every time I face a struggle and a trial, I could just, I, you know, I wish I could say that I do that every time that I face something in my life, but I, I can't say I do. There's times where I throw a pity party for myself. God, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? He's such a gracious father, though. He just listens to me. <laughs> Says, it's okay. Just trust me. So how do we react if we sing and praise and just think, God, here's what happened afterwards. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke to see the prison doors wide open, and he assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew a sword to kill himself. See, in those days that if you let a prisoner escape on your watch, you were a dead man. That uh, should never happen. So he was just going to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, What must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in the household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized and he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. See what happens when we react properly? See, I don't, you know, it doesn't really say here in the passage, but my theory is that this whole thing was a setup. Out of God's love for that Philippian jailer and his family, he knew that, you know, Paul and Silas might go through a little discomfort, but do you think they'd trade that discomfort for what happened to that family? If we react to things properly and we give God the praise through it, who knows what could happen on the other side? Your testimony is a powerful tool. You know, your testimony is, is, is what can change people sometimes, just telling your story, just telling the story of all the things you've been through. I, you know, made a commitment a while ago that, that um, I'm not going to let the enemy, I, you know, I spoke to the enemy, I said, I'm not going to let you Keep me from telling my testimony, telling my story. Because if I went through all these things in vain, I don't want that to happen. I want everything that I've been through, all the pain, the struggle that I've been through in my life, I want it to be for something. I'm not going to let the enemy keep me from telling my story. I want to use it for God's glory. I want to make the devil mad that he ever messed with me. I want to make him upset that he ever tried to attack me or my family. I'm going to tell and preach the good news of Jesus to everybody that I see. Because God is good. He's a good father. If we react like this to the things that happen in our lives, who knows what could happen? Who knows the Philippian jailer that he has for you? Who knows what's going to happen on the other side of your trial and temptation? But I know this, Romans 8.28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. See, God's not the one causing all these things, but I know that he can work together everything for good if we love God. We may never understand this side of heaven, why these things are happening. But again, I'm going to pose the question to you. Are you going to trust him? Do you trust that he's a good God? Do you trust that he has good plans for you? Do you trust that there's a testimony way down the other side? You know, you can't have a testimony without a test. You're never going to have a story to tell without going through something. We're all going to have things that we go through in our lives. When, um, When I was a kid, my father was a pastor, and when you're a pastor's kid, one thing that goes along with it is you have to move a lot. So from the time that I was born until um, I think it was age eight, we moved like 10 times. I mean, it was something ridiculous. Like 
you know, and I was kind of a shy, reserved kid, so having to make new friends everywhere was, you know, sometimes hard because, you know, I'd be, you know, just, I was just a shy kid. Go figure, I'm a preacher now, right? <laughs> but um, in the third grade, we moved back to uh, southwest lower Michigan, a little town called Niles. Not much to it, but we settled there, and, um, you know, I started to make friends, and life was just great. I was like, finally, you know, we were there for seven years. Finally, I could, you know, make a, you know, have friends that I, you know, could actually be with for a while. And I was excited to go through high school with them and graduate and, you know, just, you know, have friends for life. And before my sophomore year that summer, my parents called us in the living room and said, you know what? Um, God has called us to move to Lansing. And I was devastated. We moved and... I was just, I was angry. I was real angry at God because my parents said, well, God is calling us there, right? So who else to blame? But God, if you're calling us there, you're taking me away from my friends. You know, it's your fault. So I became, you know, as a teenager, I became bitter. I became angry at God. I started to rebel and, you know, just didn't want to have anything to do with them. And, you know, God is so gracious and patient with us. Even when we're struggling, even when we, you know, say terrible things about him, he still loves us and he wants the best for us. And he's just, he's just so patient with us. He was patient with me. And one night I was just sitting there just, you know, thinking about how angry I was and just the Holy Spirit just ministered to me. And I, I, at that night I just surrendered to God and said, you know what? I don't, want to, I don't want to feel like this anymore. I don't want to be angry. You know, I give my life to you. And years Later, I've met my beautiful wife. I uh, got to meet Pastor Phil in high school, and we were reconnected, and I got to be part of this amazing church, this amazing family. None of this would have happened if I would have stayed in Niles. See, it took a little discomfort for me to get to the place that I am today. I wouldn't trade it for anything now. I want to trade where I am for anything. I'm so thankful now that God called us to Lansing. I'm so thankful for that. Sometimes God just has to get us out of our comfort zones. Sometimes we're just stuck in a place where we're comfortable, but God has greater things for us. And we have to ask the question, are you going to trust him? Are we going to trust that this this discomfort that I'm feeling right now is going to be for my good? That he has a greater place for us. That he has a greater opportunity for me on the other side. Are you going to trust him? Would you stand with me? If you would close your eyes and bow your head. We're going to pray. Father, I just thank you. Lord, I thank you that through times in our lives when we don't understand why, why things are happening, Lord, we can trust you because we know you have our best in mind. Father, if there are those here today that are struggling with this question, maybe there's an illness that's attacking their body, maybe it's their family that are having trouble, maybe it's financial difficulties. Father, I pray right now that you would just minister to to them through your Holy Spirit that you would bring peace to their hearts. Lord, and that you would help them to understand, Father, that you have good things in store for them. And Lord, that even though they don't know why, Father, we just pray that they would trust you. Lord, we give these situations to you, Father, and we know that you are in control and that you have the best for us. Father, I pray that as we go throughout this week, Lord, that we would just, every time we face a difficulty and face a circumstance, Father, we would do what Paul and Silas did and just pray and sing, Father. That we would respond, Lord, the way that um, they did and that we would see chains broken off, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, you would set people up in our way that we can share our testimony with, Father, and that we can just spread the good news of the gospel and the goodness of our daddy to this, everyone we meet, Father. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.